All right, and I will probably be making that same joke later in my slides anyways, so. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, my name is Patrick, and I really like Unicode. And if you'll allow me, for the next 15 minutes, I'll try to pull back the curtain on why I like Unicode, because I think there's a lot to like about it. Um, but before talking about this jargony word, Unicode, maybe I'll use some of Vaidehi's learning technique and explain this simple term in simple terms. So Unicode is about 20% cooler than ASCII. Um, the next leading um, text encoding uh, standard. So ASCII is probably the uh, piece of jargon that you've heard if you think about how to encode text. Uh, it encodes basic Latin characters, like what you would find in English, uh, but it doesn't encode Turkish, or Latin, or Tamil, or Arabic, or any of the other world's languages and scripts. Um, some people extend ASCII to make a Turkish kind of an ASCII, but people who extend ASCII to make a Tamil kind of an ASCII find that their two encodings are mutually exclusive. Unicode, uh, unifies those encodings, Unicode. Uh, and everyone finds this to be a really cool thing. And in fact, 70 or 80% of the internet finds this to be a really cool thing. And I think it's a really cool thing too. Uh, it's compatible with Estonian grandparents, which is what we need because then your Estonian grandparent can send you text on WhatsApp and you can still read them and not have to care about it 99% uh, of the time. Uh, and even better, it's pretty much future-proof. Uh, we can see here, there is a colored square uh, that I'm showing up there. Um, that is just 1 16th of the Unicode address space for encoding all the characters of the world. Uh, most of it is a beautiful salmon pink that's Chinese, Japanese, and Korean characters encoded. At the top, there is a black and purple rainbow, which is all of ASCII. Uh, and then the next two blue squares are also fully, almost fully used. But the whole rest of those squares represent the rest of Unicode, which is completely unassigned and ready for encoding whatever languages humans come up with in the next millennia. And indeed, it does encode just about every script. Uh, you can spot some of your favorites. Uh, there is just about all of Chinese, Japanese, Korean characters, uh, Cyrillic, Latin, of course, uh, Arabic, Devanagari, Braille, even. Um, and importantly, there are some of the rarer languages that usually don't get funding for these sorts of things, like Hanifu Rohingya, which was, um, it took years to encode, but it was finally encoded in about 2017 which turned out to be very topical because that was when um, Rohingya people were in the news. Um, and we can also encode hieroglyphs, which is also great. We need that. Uh, and we can also encode emoji. That's not even a script, but we still encode it. Um, and if you haven't seen emoji before, you can see one in this slide, uh, the second bullet point. Yeah, um, and apart from being colorful and fun, I think the great part about emoji is that it's a sneaky way of getting people to support Unicode. Uh, engineers see emoji and they're like, wow, I want that. <laughs> so they, they're like, all right, well, we'll support these emoji things. But unbeknownst to them, now they also support Arabic. So <laughs> joke's on them. <laughs> yeah, um, and as colorful they are, uh, they still take a while to be approved. And we'll get into the like how Unicode manages all these characters later. Uh, but let's look at the specific case of emoji and how they're approved by Unicode. Uh, and this is how they're approved. Those three people at the top right um, are the three people who have voting power to um, include emoji in Unicode or reject emoji from inclusion in Unicode. Uh, including some people, oh yeah, and here's my joke about white boxes. Um, up there near Jennifer Lee's picture, there should be a picture or an emoji of a hijabi and a pork dumpling, but they're not there. Um, 
yeah, so she submitted those emoji and they were included in Unicode. And that was voted on by those three people up there. And other people also uh, submit emoji proposals, including this person in the bottom right, uh, who isn't a member of the emoji committee, but nonetheless made like an auto rickshaw emoji. Um, and also, it turns out, was the actual person who did the work for encoding, say, Hanif, Hanifi Rohingya uh, script. But while we're on the topic of who makes decisions for what goes in Unicode, uh, maybe let's look at the bulk of Unicode, which is script, because that's what we're supposed to be doing anyways. Um, every character that goes into Unicode has to be reviewed by a lot of people. And they accept a lot of things, but they also reject a lot of things. And it's not immediately clear why we should care about this, but I think it is important because these people make decisions uh, that a lot of people in the world care about because 80% of the internet uses Unicode. So whether Hanafi Rohingya gets funding or not is decided by these people. Uh, and other hot topics like whether uh, traditional Chinese and simplified Chinese characters um, are distinguished or they're just lumped together, those decisions are also made by the people on this Unicode board. Uh, as an example of this, there are two pairs of characters here. On the left are two distinct characters in Unicode. Uh, the decision was made to separate those. One is traditional, one is simplified. But on the right, uh, that's technically the same character in Unicode. Uh, and it doesn't seem like a huge deal to maybe most of you, but this is something that um, people care about, especially people who have to write in traditional or simplified Chinese. Uh, and this is some of the people who make those decisions, uh, specifically the companies. So there's like two categories, one bigger than the other. One category is West Coast tech companies, Apple, Microsoft, uh, Google. And the other category is Indian governments. Um, <laughs> and yeah, so there are three Indian governments and the government of Bangladesh that are represented as voting members of Unicode. Uh, and the actual people who make the decisions um, are represented by maybe these people, the board of directors. Um, not really by this person here, but I just included him because he's from Waterloo. <laughs> um, yeah, but a lot of the people who make the decisions of Unicode um, are native European language speakers, uh, and they also have lots of language degrees in languages like Arabic, Maltese, German, um, several Chinese linguists as well. Uh, so they really are area experts. Otherwise, they wouldn't be making these decisions. Um, and for the most part, they've done a great job encoding the world's scripts. Uh, but sometimes uh, there is some disconnect between Unicode decisions at a high level in this organization and uh, people who actually have to use Unicode, uh, like people who write Bengali, as an example. Uh, Bengali has lots of characters, uh, and sometimes the way people write characters from Bengali is kind of convoluted. Uh, Unicode doesn't code just about every Bengali character, um, but they kind of stop when uh, they consider how people actually write these characters. Uh, and an example of how this can be annoying is this character on the right, which is encoded. But the way to write this is you write two uh, characters here and then a zero with the joiner, which uh, if any of you know how that's relevant, I'd be impressed because <laughs> it's definitely not obvious um, how, to, how a zero with the joiner, which isn't even a visible character, gets turned into that. Um, yeah, but for the most part, um, all the world scripts are encoded, and it's great. I think Unicode is great. Uh, but sometimes, and I've said before, 
99% of the time, Unicode is great, but there's always the 1% of the time where uh, you have to stop and maybe Google some things about Unicode and figure out why something weird is happening. Uh, and I'll just go over some of the usual problem areas. Uh, I won't explain how to fix all of them because I have 15 minutes. Um, but maybe so that you can remember these and Google them later. Uh, so some example assumptions that we, you would think are simple and safe, but aren't true anymore. Uh, if you take an uppercase character in Unicode and find the lowercase of it, the lowercase version might be two characters long instead of one character for the uppercase version, which is weird. Um, as an example, the German double S, that's one character long, um, but changing the case of it might turn it into two S characters. Uh, some other ones, uh, characters are maybe not just one byte uh, to encode, especially with different encodings, they can be four bytes or something. Uh, and even concatenating two strings together can change how those two strings are displayed. Uh, which is usually not something you have to care about with, say, ASCII. Um, and it turns out a lot of people realize that there's a lot of corner cases here, so very smart people have written things about Unicode security. So if you Google Unicode security, you'll find a list on the Unicode website saying these are a lot of like the security corner cases that um, Unicode presents. And then if you Google Unicode security recommendations, they'll tell you how to fix them. Um, but there are a lot of uh, strange corner cases. Uh, one of my more favorite corner cases is this character here, the Arabic on the very right. Um, that like three small lines of text is actually one character, uh, all packed in together. Although if you... Um, normalize it, apply uh, some sort of transformation, it can actually expand itself into like 16 characters, a full sentence, which I think is cool. Um, but there are lots of other cases, like here, um, actually I'll just go to the next slide and it'll be more obvious. Um, Unicode introduces a lot of other characters that look alike um, in English Latin some examples would be a capital case I and a lower case L. Uh, but Unicode introduces a lot more of those and sometimes people can exploit those to not only trick humans but also trick computer systems. Um, a real world example is the Spotify user forums where uh, an attacker was actually able to reset user passwords of any arbitrary account by writing down the small capital case version of someone's username and submitting that in a user form, which isn't immediately obvious why that would allow you to reset someone's username. Um, but at the kernel of it, uh, it was because taking that small capital uh, special characters, if you take the lowercase of them, they turn into regular capitals, but if you take the lowercase again, they turn into lowercase letters. Uh, and through this, there was a bug in the uh, user password resetting mechanism that allowed attackers to reset moderators' passwords. And I know I've just spent the last few slides talking about all the corner cases of Unicode that you might want to um, step back and Google yourself, um, but I still think Unicode is great, 99% uh, of the time. Uh, it allows your Estonian grandparents to send you WhatsApp messages, uh, but it also allows your Tamil grandparents to send you WhatsApp messages. Uh, and really, it, a lot of the hard work for encoding the world scripts is already done with Unicode. That'll allow everyone to write down their own language and not have to like stuff it into maybe not appropriately fitting uh, English friends of it. Uh, it 
almost makes a first-class language out of every language in the world. And I think that's a lot of work done, and there's just a lot of, it's really cool. Unicode's great. <laughs> Stony and grandparents, thank you.